1. I live in the Netherlands. Even though I can speak a good word of English, I want to give my apologies if I make lots of grammar and spelling mistakes. Also, sorry if it sounds so cliché. I'll talk a bit about myself first before I move on with this story. I live in a pretty busy and big neighbourhood, and weird things rarely occur here. Sure, there have been some robbery attempts at a few local stores around night time, but that happened a few years ago. Before and after this, this neighbourhood has been quite a safe place. My neighbourhood is like a very big circle which contains a playground, a football field, a small field to walk your dog, a basketball court and an elementary school. During the day it's totally packed with children and their parents, and people who play either football or basketball. But when the evening falls in, the streets become totally empty. This place used to be a sort of rendezvous point for a very small group of drug dealers. But that number has diminished due to the district officer driving around here frequently. Since then, the attempted robberies have died out. This place consists of lots of apartment complexes. I live in a regular house myself, in a small street, which is leading to the highway. Presenting myself, I'm a 17-year-old boy. I'm 6 feet 5 tall, but pretty skinny and very weak. I've never been in a fight before and I always try to seek the best possible way to avoid trouble. I have two cats and my back door consists of a cat door. That thing makes a hell of a noise when it slams shut and it always scares the crap out of me. There are a lot of stray cats walking around stealing the food from my cats. So I hear the cat door slamming pretty frequently. Our back door is made out of wood but has a huge glass window in the middle so you could look outside easily. Our living room has a glass siding door but we rarely ever open it. The main area I want to focus on is my quote unquote garden. My garden is relatively small. Within five huge steps I can make it from my back door to the end of my garden. We have a backlight that turns on when movement is detected. Adjacent to it is a very huge field which is kind of property to the long row of apartment complexes standing here. The people who live here come and go with their scooters and bikes. All the area is surrounded by a fence. The back area of the streets are separated by a locked gate surrounded by a wall. I can peek over it rather easily so with a good speed and power you can just climb over it like it's no big deal. Our back light turns on when my cats walk by sometimes or when someone from the apartment rides along. I find it rather annoying, but I have to deal with it. The gate's lock has been broken now for a while. Some morons who leave to go to work or either to go back home leave the gate wide open or either just push it in its closed state and don't lock it with their keys. The smallest amount of wind can knock that gate wide open again. About a month ago, I was walking home from my girlfriend's place. It usually takes me to walk 5 to 10 minutes to reach her home and vice versa. Separated by the highway, while waiting to cross the highway, I suddenly had a very eerie feeling. I couldn't really make out what the eerie feeling was about or why I got it. The least I could say is that my guts told me something I should be on the lookout for. I mostly leave my girlfriend's place around 11pm, which means I'm for 90% of the time walking out alone in the whole neighbourhood. I cross the highway and walk down past the elementary school, and I noticed a black car parked on the nearest parking lot. It wasn't really that far away from me, so I could see that someone was still in the vehicle. In the car sat a man who looked pretty young. I would guess around 25 years old, or at least his 30s. He was looking straight at me with a blank expression on his face. He didn't even look away or blink for a second, which started to creep me out. My gut feeling started to act up again, so I tried to book myself right out of that street I was walking in. By passing a corner, I broke the line of sight with that guy, and around 5 to 10 seconds later, I hear an engine start up in the distance. 
trying my best not to turn my head too much. I was looking in the corner of my eye, as far as I could see, if I wouldn't get chased by that freak. Unfortunately, luck wasn't my ally, and I noticed a car rolling up very slowly behind me. His headlights were off to conceal himself as much as possible. He didn't try to catch me, or to surpass me to drive off. There was still a certain distance between us. But despite that, I started to panic slightly, and started to speedwalk my way home. When I arrived close to my house, I sprinted to my front door and smashed the door closed. My parents noticed I was in a little bit of shock and told them what happened. They didn't think much of it, but they demanded that I would return home a bit earlier just in case. Before I went to bed, around 15 minutes later, I slightly peeked through the blinds and I noticed the same car just standing there in the street. He was stood around another corner but it was just enough to see the front of his car. I don't know if he saw the blinds moving or not, but right when I peeked at him, he drove off. Since that time, I haven't seen or heard anything. Then suddenly, a few weeks back, my parents went to a party with my sister, and I returned home for my girlfriend a bit earlier. I should say around 9.30, and because it was early, I thought I would game a bit until my parents came back home. It was a Saturday, so I could expect them to be back around 12pm or even later. I was ready to play some Counter-Strike with a few friends on TimeSpeak, until I heard some noises from the back door. It stopped very briefly, so I thought it was one of my cats, or even a stray cat running in or out of my house, or even encountering another stray cat. And then there is a lot of annoying hissing and fighting between them. I proceeded to talk to my friends, until not so long after, I hear the same noise again. I noticed my backlight was flickering a few times, so that meant at least something was in my garden. I took the headset off my ears and listened a while longer. It didn't sound like my cat door at all, more like a thumping noise. Thinking that something got knocked over, I walked into the kitchen, turned on the light, and saw a tall figure standing outside, fumbling at my back door lock. He was clothed in all black, and a hoodie covering his face. He didn't seem to notice I had turned on the kitchen light, but a few seconds after he noticed me and sprinted right out of my garden into the fields. I couldn't believe my eyes for a second, and stood there frozen for what felt like half a minute. Then reality struck me, followed by pure panic and fear, and I called the cops immediately. It took 15 minutes for them to arrive, and they investigated the back area thoroughly. The thing that scared me the most was that they found a gun on the ground right in front of my back door. I guess the person dropped it when he ran away. They asked me a few more questions, and then left. I called my parents to come home right away, and explained everything. The only question I have is why the person ran away when he saw me. As I mentioned, I have a glass door in my living room, which he could see me easily through from a distance. Even all the lights were on besides those from the kitchen. Either this person tried to surprise me, or thought I wouldn't notice the noise because I was wearing my headset. We haven't heard anything since, and I had trouble sleeping at night. And also I feel not comfortable anymore to do some late night gaming when my parents are going to sleep. In my suspicion, I think it was the person who followed me slowly a while back. I'm glad the person fled, and I don't know what would have happened if he succeeded to get in. Luckily he didn't. 2. This happened when I was either 5 or 6 years old. I have Asperger's, although I went undiagnosed for my entire childhood. My grandmother who raised me was very old school, and I think the idea that her granddaughter was a flawed child was unthinkable. Anyway, part of my condition is that I have a difficult time picking up on subtle social cues. As a kid, this made me extremely gullible, and I tended to believe what people told me at face value. A lot of backstory. 
I know. But it's important to understand the context of the story. Not to mention what got me into the situation in the first place. So one Sunday afternoon, I was playing in the fenced area of my grandmother's front yard. Normal kid stuff, mostly. I think I had my Barbies with me. All of a sudden, this neighborhood kid I didn't know pokes his head over the fence and says hello. He was twice my age, dark hair, dark eyes. I can't remember his name, so for the sake of the story, I'll be calling him John. Now, Stranger Danger was something that was drilled into our heads over and over again at school. But it was always about adults. No one ever once warned us about going anywhere with kids we didn't know. At some point, I told John that it was getting too hot to play outside, and I was going inside to play video games, on my then brand new NES. This was when he told me that he had a bunch of NES cartridges to give me for free if I went over to his house. Thank God my grandmother had more sense than a five-year-old autistic kid. She told me that the only way I was going to a 12-year-old boy's house was if she knew where his house was and his phone number. John happily complied with this request. But even my grandmother didn't suspect that John not only had deliberately given her the wrong address, but the wrong phone number as well. As we were walking to John's house, he suddenly turned straight towards a wooded area behind the houses, lining a curve in the road. Even as a gullible kid, I suspected something was up. I asked John why we weren't going to his house. I actually lied, he admitted. I don't live in a house. My parents are dead. For most normal kids, this would be a sign to nope the fuck out. If a kid's parents are dead, no way in hell would he be living in the woods in Arizona. But between my age and my disorder, I not only believed John, but I pitied him too. He told me he still had the cartridges for me, and like an idiot, I believed him and followed him into the woods. After about 30 minutes of following John, I knew something was seriously wrong. The alarm bells were finally going off. I told him I wanted to go home. I didn't want his NES cartridges anymore. After a pause, John said, Okay, and started leading me back the way we came. But he kept stopping, moving in false starts, looking around. Finally, he said that he'd made a mistake, and now he was lost. That made me mad and scared. I knew he was lying. I told him to take me back to my grandma's house, now that it was hot and I was thirsty. By this time, it was late in the afternoon, around four or so. This is where I look back and get seriously creeped out. John looked at me and smiled. You're thirsty. Why didn't you say so? He led the way to a leftover rain puddle that hadn't dried up yet. I stared at him. Did he really expect me to drink from that? I don't have a cup, I told him. Just get down and drink it like a dog, he said. I got down on my knees, but I only took the water to cool off with. Even as a kid, I knew you're never supposed to drink dirty water. While I was wetting my forehead and neck down to cool off, John started churning up the water to make it muddy, still trying to convince me it was fine, and that I should lap it up like a dog. What the fuck, kid? After a while, I realized I could hear a familiar sound. The major highway that ran perpendicular to the road that led into my neighborhood. Looking down the hill we were on, I could even just barely make out the cars traveling on it. I didn't even hesitate. I ran all the way down that hill with John calling after me. I couldn't hear what he said, and I didn't care. If I found the highway, I could find my way back home. I climbed a barbed wire fence and ripped a hole in the pants I was wearing getting to the highway. John caught up to me once I reached the sidewalk, telling me to come back into the woods with him. No, I shouted at him. I'm going home. At this point, a police car came up to where we were standing. My grandma had called the number John gave her, only to find out it was the wrong number. When she went to the house he described, and it was the wrong one, she called the police. So this cop asked my name and I told him. 
He said my grandma was worried about me, and I was so happy to see him I started crying. Then another car pulled up. A woman stuck her head out of the window. John, get your ass into the car right now. My stomach dropped. I looked up at John. I thought you said you lived in the woods. The woman's face contorted further in her anger. No, he doesn't live in the woods. I'm his mother. At this point, the cop told them both to stay put, and he put me into his car. I couldn't hear what was being said. But in the end, the cop let John go into his mother's car, and he drove me home. My grandma was plenty pissed at me for going with John after he told me he lived in the woods. But I think she was just glad to have him back unharmed. It wasn't until years later that I realized just how fucked up the entire situation was. To this day, I don't know why John wanted to lure a five-year-old girl into the woods. But I'm glad I never found out. If you're reading this, John, even if you weren't planning to hurt me that day, you are still one sick fuck. Let's never meet again. If we do, I'll probably end up punching you in the teeth. 3. I was only 12 when we started receiving calls, without the other side speaking. First, my parents thought it was a problem in our line. We called the phone company, but nothing happened. It took us almost a year to realize that only when I picked up the phone, the caller didn't hang up right away. He kept listening to my voice and breathing hard for me to listen to him. This continued for two years, and when I was 14, I started receiving flowers. At school, at home, even when I was staying in my friends' houses, he would send flowers there. Then started the letters and emails, always with pictures of me with a boy, with friends, and a very few intimate pics of me changing clothes or in the pool. That's when my parents called the police, who said that there is nothing wrong in taking pictures of a 15-year-old in bikini or underwear. Yeah, great place we have. I started feeling uneasy and always looking back as if I was being followed all the time. I lost my liberty. Half of my friends got so scared that they didn't want to hang out with me anymore. And then I went to live with my grandparents in another town. Another school. Everything went back to normal. No more letters. No more photos. Or any contact at all. I started dating and my boyfriend received threats. My stalker was back. A few months later, still dating, Stalker sent me pictures of my boyfriend with another girl. We broke up. The same day my stalker sent my grandparents home a lot of flowers and a romantic letter telling me he would never do this with me. Moved back in parents' house because I was not safe in my grandparents anymore. That's when he broke in and stole all my underwear. We called the police again. And this time they drew a report telling us our home would be monitored, etc. But of course, this was BS. My senior year, I had a new boyfriend, great friends, and my school was very protective. They never delivered any letters or flowers to me. They notified the police and installed more security at the front. My stalker got very angry at the call to the police and decided to attack me at prom. He glued a large piece of gum in my hair so that I cut it very short. To me, it was very scary because he could have hurt me. After all, he got that close to me. He sent me an email telling me that I was an ungrateful whore and that he would rape me the next time he saw me. He also said he knew I was a virgin and he was anxious to be the one to fuck me first. For more than a month, I didn't leave my house. Ever. Not even got close to a window. It was almost a house arrest. My email was filled with his little notes. Most of the time was harmless. Good morning, beautiful. Sleep tight. But sometimes he would send nude pics of his body holding my underwear, or pics of him with a girl wearing my panties. Police again told me there was nothing they could do because there was no real threat. I enroll in the local college because I could not live alone. I had French and English lessons three times a week, and an older neighbor enroll in the same language school. 
His mom was good friends with mine, and my parents saw no problem on letting me get a ride with him. It was easier than the bus, and a lot faster. The guy was 25 years old, and I was 17. He was cute, had a strong body, and he treated me very well. For two months, he was polite and sweet. After this, I started flirting with him. It was light and innocent in my eyes. But I guess he saw that as a declaration of love. So when he left me at home, he thought it was okay for him to follow me inside. I knew my parents were at home, but I did not want him alone with me. So I said he could not come in. He lost his mind, forced himself in, and kissed me. Licked me, not stopping with my screams. He was way stronger than I was. Me crying actually bothered him. He said he never meant to hurt me. He loved me. I knew I loved him back. He tried to calm me down, to relax me so I could enjoy his lovemaking. Luckily, my parents arrived and he ran away. Called the police and spent the night at the hospital, but I was safe with mom and dad. Next day, they arrested him and confirmed he was my stalker. He had more than 1,000 pictures of me and pieces of clothing that went missing over the years. Even my pillow cover was in his bed. Worst part of my nightmare. He was never locked up because I was unharmed somehow. He hadn't committed any crime? My parents sent me to live in Europe for a while. Got back to South America. And now I'm living in Asia. He still tries to contact me. He builds fake profiles to follow me on Facebook and keeps sending me emails with naked pictures or videos of him pleasing himself. My husband also received a few threats, but he says he doesn't care. I'm happy to be living far away in a safe country. Glad he can't find me where I live. Hey everyone, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 88. As always, I'm never happy. So with these stories, I've been tweaking the audio levels again, back recording in Ableton. Haven't done that for a little while. I think I've actually finally found some settings that work well for me. I managed to get the, there's a, a function here called the noise gate. And what it does is it allows you to re reduce certain sounds. And I've got that working in a way that's actually useful to me now. So it makes it quicker for me. Making videos makes it quicker to record and cuts down on my editing. I still have to use Audacity for certain things because it's just more convenient for editing out long silences, that sort of thing. And uh, just a few little tweaks here and there. But yeah, I think I've got these programs working to working together in harmony in a way that I'm happy with. Right, now... It's the weekend, but I've got a long weekend ahead of me. What I'm doing this weekend is I'm actually getting everything together. I've got all my stories. I'm going to record all of those. I've done a few so far, but I'm going to record the rest over the next two days, and I'll probably spend the rest, once I'm done with that, I'll spend the rest of Sunday night putting everything together for Monday so I can get that up on time. I'm quite looking forward to that. I hope you guys are too. Okay, so until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourselves.